everyone. Hello. Let's start. Um, my name is Amit Abir. This is Eyal. Uh, we're going to discuss today our use case for using uh, QCal2 chains uh, using QMU. Um, so a little bit about us. So I'm Amit. I joined Oracle Ravello uh, in 2011, and I'm currently the team leader of uh, virtual and uh, network and storage. And this is Eyal. He's a programmer, a software engineer in our virtualization group. So uh, this is the agenda for today. We're going to discuss how we use in Oracle Ravello QCO chains in QMU, what is our unique use case. And for that, I will need to do a short introduction about how our product, uh, how our product works. Then we're going to discuss our design for the storage layer, some implementations, and challenges we encountered, and their solutions. So let me begin by describing what is Oracle Ravello. This is important to understand the rest of the talk. So Oracle was founded in 2011 uh, by the same guys who started Kumranet, which created HVX, uh, KVM, sorry. Um, and it was acquired by uh, Oracle in 2016. So Oracle Ravello is basically what we call a virtual cloud provider. So it runs just like any other cloud provider, but on top of other cloud providers, such as AWS, Amazon's cloud, and Google Cloud, and also OCI, which is the Oracle cloud infrastructure. What we do is to allow easy lift and shift. Lift and shift is uh, the migration of on-premise data center virtualization environment uh, workloads to the public cloud. And we do it without need to change, not the VM images, not even a single bit, not the network configuration, and without changing any storage configuration. So what are the challenges when migrating workloads to the cloud? First of all, the virtual hardware. Different hypervisors have different virtual hardware they support to their guests. For example, they support, they expose different chipsets, different disk and net controllers, different firmwares, different PCI topology, and so on. We must bridge over these gaps in order to allow seamless running of the VMs on the public cloud. Also, there is a difference in network capabilities and topology. Today, the public clouds do not support it supports only L3 IP-based communications. It means there are no switches, no VLANs, no mirror ports, and no any uh, non-IP traffic they support. So this is another challenge we need to handle. How do we do that? Ravel or Oracle do that by utilizing nested virtualization. We have created our own uh, binary translation hypervisor that is called HVX, which is optimized to run on other hypervisors, such as KVM or Xen, on top of the public clouds, uh, cloud instances. When the public cloud exposes uh, virtual uh, hardware assist, we can run KVM directly, and we do that. Also, we have our own enhanced QMU and firmwares for supporting, for example, uh, virtual devices from VMware, such as VMXNet3 and PVSCSI, which we uh, contributed to mainland QMU today. Also, we have our enhanced uh, framework to support, for example, uh, running VMs from, uh, from uh, ES6, ESX, and so on. Um, to bridge over the gaps on, in network capabilities, we created our own software-defined network, our SDN. What it does, it, it's lever it, it is leveraging uh, Linux SDN components, such as turn-tap devices, TC actions, and so on, to create a fully distributed network with distributed uh, network functions, such as DNS and DHCP servers, and virtual switch that leverages open vSwitch capabilities. But this is a conversation for a whole different talk. So let me describe to you the flow from the customer's perspective. What, what's happening? So the customer, as you see at the bottom left, he, the customer has some data center with some specific hardware and some hypervisor like VirtualBox, Hyper-V, uh, or whatever, that runs uh, some VMs, three VMs with a specific network configuration. Then the user uses Ravello import tool to upload the VM images to Ravello image storage. I will elaborate on that a little bit later. Then, the second step, as you can see on the bottom right, the user drags and drops in our management console, the VMs. It, it then configures the network configuration or any other configuration needed for those VMs. Then it clicks on one button, publish, and we automatically create a cloud instance on some 
public cloud, any public cloud, where that runs the, the, public, cloud, the public cloud hypervisor, such as KVM or Zen. On top of that, we start our own hypervisor. And on top of that, nested virtualization, we start, we start the user VMs, and we run it the same way as it was in the data center. The user cannot notice the difference. Okay, so this was our product. And what I'm going to discuss today, the, the, the topic of the conversation would be our storage layer. What challenges did we have while trying to solve this problem? So the first and most important question is to where to place the VM disks data. Okay, it has to be somewhere. Um, the, 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 the choose we need to make should support multiple clouds and multiple regions because we want to be able to support more clouds and more regions of those clouds in the future. Also, the data must be fetched in real time. The user cannot sit and wait for the VM to boot. It must start to boot immediately. Another core business of ours is to clone a VM fast. This is in order to support, for example, dev and test scenarios where the user creates its initi uh, the initial environment and then replicates it multiple times to test different scenarios. Also, the clone scenarios is used for global training, like those Red Hat does today. Today, Red Hat delivers all of their uh, international uh, training courses on top of Ravelo. They did it by creating an initial, an initial training environment and replicates it to different um, uh, regions to reach, uh, to reach global uh, regions. And also, the last point is that writes to the disk must be persistent. If the user did some writes, changed the VM, maybe it was a database, the writes should be kept somewhere so the next time the user starts the VM, whether it's in the same cloud and region or in other regions, the data should be kept persistently, okay? So let's try to solve this problem. Let's try the most basic solution. We can place the VM data directly on the cloud volume, EBS for those of you who know that. Uh, the cloud volume is a persistent block storage device that is uh, exposed to the cloud instance. You can attach it and you can, by that, expand the, the disks for uh, the VM. So we can place the data on the volume whether the VM was started and whether it is stopped. Once the VM starts, we attach the volume with the data to the, to the instance, and we expose to QMU uh, the volume uh, exposed device as its disk backing for, in order to run the VM. Um, and the writes to the volume would be done um, locally on the volume. Once we're done, we can detach the volume and keep it for later use. So the advantage of this solution is obviously the performance. The data is available. It is right there. And we have zero time to first byte. The VM can start the boot immediately. But it has some disadvantages. First of all, currently the cloud volumes are obviously cloud dependent and cloud bounded and also region bounded. You cannot move a volume between different regions in the same cloud. Also, we have a long cloning time even in the same region because you have to copy the entire data to a different volume so you can attach it to a different VM or to the same VM in different place. And the third point is that it, it is way too expensive. Keeping the data in the volumes all the time, whether the VM was started or not, is not very good regarding the costs. So let's try an alternative solution. We can place the data in the cloud's object storage, like the S3 of Amazon. Uh, the object storage is a persistent data storage meant to keep large amount of data and to retrieve it uh, globally and hopefully efficiently. So we can place the raw file, uh, the file in a raw format directly on the object storage and then whenever the user starts the VM, we can download the data to an empty volume that we will attach to the VM when it started and then the process would be the same as the previous solution. Writes would be done locally and when we're done, we can upload the file back to the object storage. So the advantages comparing to the previous solution, now the data is globally available. We can use it in any cloud or any region. This is the purpose of the object storage. Also, the cloning is fast. You can start multiple VMs at the same time, and they would all, all download the data at the same time. The object storage supports that. Comparing to keeping the data on the volumes themselves, it is much more, it is uh, inexpensive comparing to that. But this solution also have some disadvantages. 
First of all, we have a long boot time. In order to start the VM, we first need to download the entire file. This is in order to expose to the QMU as the backing, so the data should be first downloaded. Also, we have a very long snapshot time. The data has to be uploaded back to the object storage, and the VM and the volume should be kept alive while doing that. And if we're discussing uh, saving uh, different snapshots of the VMs in different times, we have to store the same sectors over and over again because the, the writes are done locally, and when we upload them to the cloud, we just save uh, another snapshot of the same file, another version. So a lot of data is being uh, duplicated, okay? So let me describe our solution which is to place the base image in the object storage and then upload only the deltas, only the new writes every time the VM needs to upload the data, whether it stops or a snapshot is taken. So what we do is we attach a volume to the VM, but it is meant only for the new writes. The new writes are written to the tip file, which is the local file that holds the new writes, and when we're done, we can upload the new file as a new link in the chain, in the image chain. Okay, then the reads could be done remotely. We don't need to download any data in advance. So what are the advantages of that? Comparing to the previous solution, the boot can start immediately. As I said, we can download the data, only the, the sectors we need directly from the object storage. We don't need to wait to download the entire chain. Also, we store only new data. We don't need to, to store duplicate sectors. And same as before, it is globally available because it's in the object storage. The cloning is fast. We can create multiple tips to the same chain, thus creating a tree. And it's quite inexpensive. But it has one disadvantage, and which is the performance penalty. We now we don't keep the file as one single file in a raw format. We're keeping a chain, and there is some performance drawbacks from reading the metadata and so on. So let me describe the architecture for our storage layer. So our VM disk data are backed by a QCOV2 image chain. As I told you, as you can see in the drawing, the cloud volumes hold the tip file, which is the file that holds all the writes, and all the reads are being done remotely, okay? I mean reads from previous parts of the chain. So this is done using our cloud file system. We call it CloudFS. It's a read-only storage layer file system. What it basically does is it, it, it just translates disk reads. When QMU read part of the chain, it just translates, translates it to HTTP request from the object storage. Also, it supports multiple clouds in multiple regions, all the clouds I mentioned before and all of it, the regions. And what it also does is to cache read data locally. As you can see in the drawing, on the local volume, we keep a cache of all the red data. This is in order to ease later reads, of course, so we don't have to uh, go to the object storage every time we read the same uh, sector over and over again. And we implemented it using Fuse, so it is implemented in user space currently. Let's see an example for the read flow. Whenever QMU reads a disk, let's say a, a file, let's say there is some file D4, it is somewhere in an image chain, not the tip file, but some file from a previous state of the VM. So there's a read command that, that is executed by QMU with some offset and some size. We then catch it in our CloudFS code as a fuse operation, and then we translate it, in this example, to HTTP GET request from the S3 of AWS. We also add a special range header to the request to get only the, the needed bytes, so we don't need to download the entire file. We just read the sectors that we need. The next step would be to cache these read bytes to the local storage, to the local volume, so we don't need to read them over and over again. Let's see an example for the write flow. Okay, so as I told you, we keep a tip, and now I omit the cloud volume, okay? You can assume that uh, the cloud VM has some volume attached to it. So the tip is located on the, on the cloud volume, and it, it is holding new reads. We create it using QMU image create command in two cases. First, before a VM starts, in order to hold its upcoming writes, and also before a snapshot is taken, if one was specifically requested by our, by our customer. If the guest is live and we don't want to turn it down, 
turn it off. We use QMP, block the uh, snapshot sync command. What it does is to replace the older tip with the new one, so the older tip could be then uploaded to the object storage. So as I explained, the tip is uploaded to the, to the uh, cloud storage in two cases. First, when the VM stops for a persistency, if the user would like to start the VM again, at later time, different cloud, you can just do it, or during a snapshot to keep a special, specific uh, state of time, uh, state in time of the VM. How do we accelerate remote reads? Okay, uh, going to the, uh, uh, requesting uh, data from the object storage all the time is not so um, efficient. So we have some optimizations we've done. First of all, we extend small requests to two megabyte requests, okay? This is first of all, first of all because we assume data read locality. If the guest needed some data from the disk, then it would probably need uh, some neighboring sectors as well. So we, we take what we can. Also, we try to balance latency and throughput. We've discovered that extending smaller requests to two megabytes does not impact uh, latency significantly, and it's, it is greatly uh, improves the throughput. So we did some experiments, and we found out that two megabytes is the optimal size in average for the clouds we use today. So this is, that's what we do. Also, we, we, we found out that giving the QCode chains random file names helps for um, requesting uh, data in parallel from the object storages. What basically happens is that different uh, cloud workers handle requests according to the file name. So if we do several requests in parallel, if the files are distributed uh, uniformly, the names, then they hit different cloud workers and so improve performance by handling more requests in parallel. Let me refer to the title of the conversation, globally distributed chains. What do I mean by that? So every time the VM starts, it can start on any cloud or any region. The user, the customer can choose that. Uh, what I didn't say is that the new data, the tip of the chain, is uploaded to the same local region where the VM was started. This is because we assume data locality. The VM would probably start again on the same region, the same cloud. It was started before. But from time to time, we see that users do want to start VMs on different clouds or different regions. So as you can see in the example, a uh, situation can be created where a VM was started several times in AWS Sydney region, and then a few times in OCI, the, the Oracle cloud in Phoenix, and then one more time in uh, Google Cloud in Frankfurt. That's creating a distributed chain in different regions, in different object storages. And the obvious problem that arises from that is that if you start the VM one more time in Frankfurt, it has to copy to read all the data from other regions, from Sydney and from Phoenix. This is very, very inefficient. It can take really lots of time. So in order to solve that, we added a regional cache. Okay, every region has its own special uh, cache to keep uh, parts of the chain from different regions. So every time we read a remote sector or a remote part of the file from a remote uh, region or another cloud, we store it in the regional cache so that after some time the VM would run as if all the data was located in its local, in its regional object storage and it would be effect, uh, more efficient. Okay. Great, so now I want to discuss a little bit in detail some performance drawbacks we found out uh, when using QCOW chains, okay? So uh, this was supposed to be the AL's uh, part of the talk, but unfortunately he lost his voice, so I'm taking over. Um, so first of all, QCOW keeps minimal information about the entire chain in its backing file. As you know, in the metadata currently, the format only saves the immediate backing uh, file and no information about the rest of the chain. So QMU must often walk the chain, especially in our scenario. And so it has to load, for example, when QMU starts, it has to load the metadata of every file in the chain when it's open all the file, when it's opening all the files. And it keeps uh, the L1 table in the RAM up to a size of one megabyte. Also, some metadata of the files are spread, especially the L2 tables, is spread across the image. So a single read request could actually cause multiple random 
random remote uh, reads from multiple store files, uh, from multiple files in the chain, okay? Also, the QMU image commands, they work on the entire virtual disk as a whole. We cannot split it into several parts. Uh, this, is ma this makes us uh, very hard to bound the execution time. When we try, for example, to run commands such as a QMU image map or rebase, we have to wait until it finishes all the virtual disk. This can be very inefficient. So, first of all, we try, we're trying to keep the QCAL2 chains short. As I explained, a new tip is created every time a VM starts and every time a snapshot is requested. And the problem is that the chains are getting longer and longer. For example, a VM that was started 100 times has a chain of 100 links, okay? This is a lot. And long chains has causes some, several problems. For example, high latency, right? Because QMU needs to walk the chain and find information in all of the QCAL2 files in the chain, which can be also be in re remote regions in our case. Also, we have a very high memory usage because for each file, QMU keeps an L1 cache uh, of up to one megabyte size, which can be uh, summed to quite a lot of overhead if we're talking about starting on one cloud instance, many VMs, okay? Of course, we can change the cache size, but it's, it is, very um, problematic for performance, right? So in order to try and keep the chains short as, as possible, we can obviously merge the tip uh, with its backing file before upload, okay? Let's see the example in the drawing. We have the virtual disk and the tip file that holds the write. It has its immediate parent, that is file A, and B, which is the rebase target. So what we do is to merge the tip with its immediate parent a, its backing file, in order to, um, and so uh, a new link is replaced by the older link, and the chain does not get any longer, right, because we merged the new writes into the previous uploaded uh, tip. But we can do it only when the tip is relatively small. We chose a size of 300 megabytes in order to keep the snapshot time minimal. Remember that we have to download the entire parent before we can do this process, and we might not, uh, we might not, not need to, okay, during the normal reads uh, of the disk. So this is an overhead, and we're trying to solve heuristically most of the cases. We've seen that usually new writes tend to be less than 300 megabytes, so it's quite all right. Also, uh, we do it in two cases, uh, either the, if the guest is live or either if the guest is offline. Live, we use QMP block stream job command in order to merge the changes from the uh, backing file to the tip, or using QMU image rebase over the rebase target, which is the grandparent, file B, okay? So let me discuss about QMU image rebase command, okay? The problem is that currently it works in a rather uh, peculiar way. Uh, what it does is to read the sectors from the old backing file, which is A, the parent, and the new backing file, which is the rebase target, B, and compare them byte by byte comparison, okay? Um, so first of all, the logic is different from QMP block stream rebase, uh, which happens completely differently. But in our case, and actually in all cases, it requires actually to read all these sectors. And for us, it's very painful. Obviously, this comparison is needed if the files are in a different chain. But in our case, since the files are in the same chain, a very easy optimization can be made by understanding that, if you can see at, in the drawing, that we don't need to compare sectors that were not changed since the rebase target. Okay, so in the drawing, the um, the extra uh, right uh, sectors that were allocated, we do not need to compare that, right? Because we just want to merge the immediate backing file with the tip. So what we did is to add a code to image rebase that we want to contribute to the community. We checks whether the files are in the same chain, and if so, we use BDRV is allocated above in order to understand whether the block was changed since the rebase target, okay? And it's, it improves uh, performance for us very significantly. For very large disks, few terabytes, reading all the metadata and reading all the sectors for comparison could practically mean downloading the entire disk. Okay, it is very inefficient. So this is how we solved this problem. 
One more problem we encountered with, this, uh, with our use case, with our storage layer, is high latency on first remote read data. As I explained, we need the user to see the VM starts its boot immediately. We don't want to wait. And there is a very high latency while fetching the, the sectors needed for boot time from the object storage. So it prolongs the boot time. It prolongs the user application startups that could be it could be very critical. And of course, it gets worthwhile with the longer chains because we have to walk the chain and read the metadata, as I explained before. So a solution to this problem would be to prefetch the disk data. While the VM is running in a different process on the same cloud VM, on the same cloud instance, we just start reading the disk data from the cloud, one disk, one, uh, um, all disk in parallel, sorry. And we try to do it only in relatively idle times in order to not interfere with the guests normal, with the VM's normal operations, okay? So a naive solution to do that would be to just download all the backing files, all the files in the chain, one by one uh, for each disk. The problem is that we can, by that, read a lot of redundant data. See this example. In this example, uh, B is the older file, and A overwritten most of the, all of, sorry, all of uh, the changes that B made. So we don't need to download file B from the object storage. Uh, it could be very large and very inefficient, okay? So what we did to overcome that is to let QMU do the work for us. We want to fetch the data according to the virtual disk to read only the latest data, right? So we use QMU NBD for that. We mount the, the, the tip image and the whole chain uh, using QMU NBD, and then we read the data using DD and let QMU do the work for us. We know that QMU would fetch only the relevant data, and we don't need to figure out ourselves why, where, it, where are the, the most updated sectors, right? So this way, we can read only the relevant data. But it introduces another problem. When, when we use that, when we use DD to read uh, all the sectors, um, the problem is that we read a lot of unallocated data, right? Usually the virtual disk is rather empty. There are many empty sectors. So when we use DD to do that, we just waste a lot of CPU cycles by reading empty data. So we would like to know where, are the, where is the real data, right? Which sectors are allocated and which not. So we use QMU image map command for that. What it does is to return a map of all the allocated sectors and where are they located in the chain. So we don't need that data, we just need to know where are the allocated sectors, right? Now it allows us to just read the allocated sectors since we know exactly where to look. This is an example of how, use, how to use the QMU image command. But uh, there's another problem. QMU image map works on the whole disk. As we explained before, it takes a long, long time to finish on longer chains because we have to read the metadata from all the backing files one by one, and there is no bound to execution time, right? And the whole point of this prefetch was to improve the boot time to start the VM faster. And we can't prefetch until we understand where are the allocated sectors. Uh, so this is very problematic. So what we had to do is to add more parameters to the QMU image map command. This is an internal work we did. Just add offset and length parameters so we can break down the QMU image command into several parts. Now we can bound the execution time and we, can, uh, we chose one gigabyte uh, parts so we can first map the first one gigabyte of the virtual disk, understand where are the allocated sectors, and then read using DD and QMU NBD only these sectors. Right? And if we see that the, this gigabyte contains only unallocated data, we don't need to read it. So this helps us to start prefetch data quickly, and it's really improved performance and boot time for our customers. So it was a good optimization. So let me summarize. Um, what we do in Oracle Ravello is uh, to, we implemented our storage layer using QCAL2 chains. And we store the data on the public cloud's object storage, S3 or Google storage and so on. Uh, QCode 2 and QMU implementations, uh, implementations are not that ideal for our use case. 
uh, first of all, QCOS2 format keeps only immediate parent information and not about not the whole chain information. So QMU must often often uh, walk the chain to understand the entire the entire structure. Also, the metadata, especially the L2 tables, is spread across the file. So multiple, so one disk request could be translated to many uh, remote requests from the object storage. And as chains are getting longer, we have performance drawback from walking the chain. So I think what we're trying to say is that we would very much like to work with the community and try to improve the performance for our use case. Um, the QMU and the QCOW format, the QMU code and QCOW format, I think often uh, relies on the fact that the chain is all available locally on the local machine, or at least that all the files are placed in the same place. So this is not always the case for our use case. So we would very much like to see improvement in that. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, I would love to answer. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. You mentioned that you use QM image rebase in order to move data from a backing file into the active file. Uh, isn't it faster to or to use uh, block stream instead? Are you talking about the rebase? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, co uh, comparing to what? Block stream. The yeah, QMP we use command. rebase only when the guest is offline, right? We use. Why should start is the again sorry? Start here. Yeah. 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 So, so the offline is done only when the VM is uh, when the VM stopped, but, right? But you can uh, start QM stopped. without VM to perform only disk operation. On the disk. I, I, don't, I don't know how to do it, but if, if you could. It's not that difficult. If you are working uh, for automation, uh, this could be done with uh, several commands. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking about DD and MAP, uh, there is a command QEMU IMG DD, which is do the trick without all nasty things with MAP. Yeah, but, but we wanted something really, really simple. It's really simple. You can start QEMU IMG DD, which is uh, working exactly like DD without NBD stuff and, uh, and without zeros in the wire. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just start speaking. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, so you mentioned using the stream command. Uh, I was wondering, did you evaluate whether the copy on read option on drives would be useful too? Because when stream was added, it was actually added together with the copy on read. And what copy on read simply means is that when the guest does a read, um, the data is copied into the image. It basically turns into a write. And that way you can bring the data up from the backing files into the, the top level as the guest is running. So that's nice if you're provisioning a new guest and you want that data to become local so it will, will be high performance. Was that interesting or did, did you um, yeah, look we, into we it? We didn't look into it, but yeah, you could, in theory, create two tips and then uh, one used for snapshotting later and the other used for prefetching. Maybe Maybe it will work better for us, maybe. And I noticed you had a combination between NBD and DD and QMU image all working together. Uh, just heads up that the NBD spec is trying to add block status so that a single NBD connection will give you status of where the holes are so that you don't need DD and map all on top of that. So there are things coming down the pipeline that sound like your use case. So pay attention to the community and chime in if you have tweaks to it that can help us. Thank you very much. It will be very helpful, obviously.
Okay, so we are out of time, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.